16. Voice of the Serpent Carr stood on the afterdeck with Bagans. It was mid-morning. The calm still held, and now the long ships were close enough to be seen from the deck. Bagaz said, At this rate they'll overhaul us by nightfall. Yes. Kars was worried. Undermanned as she was, the galley could not hope to outdistance the Khans under oars alone. And the last thing Kars wanted was to be forced into the position of fighting Ironbeard's men. He knew he couldn't do it. They'll break their hearts to catch us, he said. And these are only the van. The whole of the Sea King's fleet will be coming on behind them. Bagaz looked at the following ships. Do you think we'll ever reach Sark? Not unless we raise a fair wind, Carr said grimly. And even then, not by much of a margin. Do you know any prayers? I was instructed in my youth answered Bagaz piously. Then pray. But all that long hot day, there was no more than a breath of air to ripple the galley's sails. The men wearied at the sweeps. They had not much heart for the business at best, being trapped between two evils with a demon for captain, and they had only so much strength. The long ships doggedly, steadily grew closer. In the late afternoon, when the setting sun made a magnifying glass of the lower air, the outlook reported other ships far back in the distance. Many ships. The armada of the Sea Kings. Kars looked up into the empty sky, bitter of heart. The breeze began to strengthen. As the sails filled, the rowers roused themselves and pulled with renewed vigor. Presently, Kars ordered the sweeps in. The wind blew strongly. The galley picked up speed, and the long ships could no more than hold their own. Kars knew the galley's speed. She was a fast sailor, and with her great spread of canvas, might hope to keep well ahead of the pursuers if the wind held. If the wind held. The next few days were enough to drive a man mad. Kars drove the men in the pit without mercy. And each time the sweeps had to be run out, the beat grew slower as they reached the point of exhaustion. By the narrowest margin, Kars kept the galley ahead. Once, when it seemed they were surely caught, a sudden storm saved them by scattering the lighter ships. But they came on again. And now a man could see the horizons dotted with a host of sails, where the armada irresistibly advanced. The immediate pursuers grew from four to five, and then to seven. Kars remembered the old adage that a stern chase is a long one, but it seemed that this one could not go on much longer. There came another time of flat, hot calm. The rowers drooped and sweated at the oars, driven only by their fear of the cons, and try as they would, there was no bite in the stroke. Kars stood by the after rail, watching, his face lined and grim. The game was up. The lean longships were putting on a burst of speed, closing in for the kill. Suddenly, sharply, there came a hail from the masthead. Sail, ho! Kars whirled, following the line of the lookout's pointing arm. Sark ships! He saw them ahead racing up under a fast beat, three tall war galleys of the patrol. Leaping to the edge of the rower's pit, he shouted to the men, Pull, you dogs! Lay into it! There's help on the way! They found their last reserves of energy. The galley made a desperate, lurching run. A wain came to Kars's side. We're close to Sark now, Lord Rhiannon. If we can keep ahead a little longer... The Khans rushed down on them, pushing furiously in a last attempt to ram and sink the galley before the Sarks could reach them. But they were too late. The patrol ships swept by. They charged in among the Khans and scattered them, and the air was filled with shouts and the twangings of bowstrings and the terrible ripping sound of splintering oars as a whole bank was crushed into matchwood. 
there began a running fight that lasted all afternoon. The desperate Khans hung on and would not be driven off. The Sark ships closed in around the galley, a mobile wall of defense. Time and again the Khans attacked, their light swift craft darting in hornet-like and were driven off. The Sarks carried ballistas, and Carr saw two of the Khan ships hold and sunk by the hurtling stones. A light breeze began to blow. The galley picked up speed, and now blazing arrows flew, searching out the bellying sails. Two of the escort ships fell back with their canvas ablaze, but the Khans suffered also. There were only three of them left in the fight, and the galley was by now well ahead of them. They came in sight of the Sark coast, a low dark line above the water. And then, to Kars' great relief, other ships came out to meet them, drawn by the fighting, and the three remaining conned longships put about and drew off. It was all easy after that. Owain was in her own place again. Fresh rowers were put aboard from other ships, and one swift craft went ahead of them to carry warning of the attacks and news of Owain's coming. But the smoke of the burning longships astern was a painful thing to Kars. He looked at the massed sails of the Sea Kings in the far distance and felt the huge and crushing weight of the battle that was to come. It seemed to him in that moment that there was no hope. They came in late afternoon into the harbor of Sark. A broad estuary offered anchorage for countless ships, and on both sides of the channel the city sprawled in careless strength. It was a city whose massive arrogance suited the men who had built it, Carr saw great temples and the squat magnificence of the palace, crowning the highest hill. The buildings were almost ugly in their solid strength, their buttressed shoulders jutting against the sky, brilliant with harsh colors and strong designs. Already this whole harbor area was in a feverish sweat of activity. Word of the Sea King's coming had started a swift manning of ships and readying of defenses the uproar and tumult of a city preparing for war. Bagaz beside him muttered, We're mad to walk like this into the dragon's throat. If you can't carry it off as Rhiannon, if you make one slip, Kars said, I can do it. I've had considerable practice by now in playing the cursed one. But inwardly he was shaken, confronted by the massive might of Sark it seemed a mad insolence to attempt to play the god here. Crowds along the waterfront cheered Wayne wildly as she disembarked, and they stared in some amazement at the tall man with her, who looked like a cond and wore a great sword. Soldiers formed a guard around them and forced a way through the excited mob. The cheering followed them as they went up through the crowded city streets toward the brooding palace. They passed at length into the cool dimness of the palace halls. Cars strode down huge echoing rooms with inlaid floors and massive pillars that supported giant beams covered with gold. He noticed that the serpent motif was strong in the decorations. He wished he had Bagaz with him. He had been forced, for appearance sake, to leave the fat thief behind, and he felt terribly alone. At the silvery doors of the throne room, the guard halted. A chamberlain wearing mail under his velvet gown came forward to greet Owain. Your father, the sovereign King Garrach, is overjoyed at your safe return and wishes to welcome you. But he begs you to wait, as he is closeted with the Lord Hishar, the emissary from Caer Du. Owain's lips twisted. So already he asks aid of the serpent. She nodded imperiously at the closed door. Tell the king I will see him now. The chamberlain protested. But highness, tell him, said Owain, or I will enter without permission. Say that there is one with me who demands admittance, and whom not even Garrach nor all care do may deny. The chamberlain looked in frank puzzlement at Kars. He hesitated, then bowed and went in through the silver doors. 
Cars had caught a note of bitterness in Wayne's voice when she spoke of the serpent. He taxed her with it. No, Lord, she said. I spoke once, and you were lenient. It is not my place to speak again. Besides, she shrugged, you see how my father bars me from his confidence in this, even though I must fight his battles for him. You do not wish aid from Care Do even now? She remained silent, and Carr said, I bid you to speak. Very well, then. It is natural for two strong peoples to fight for mastery when their interests clash on every shore of the same sea. It is natural for men to want power. I could have gloried in this coming battle, gloried in a victory over Condor, but... Go on. She cried out then with controlled passion. But I have wished that Sark had grown great by fair force of arms, man against man, as it was in the old days before Garrich made alliance with Cairdu. And now there is no glory in a victory won before even the hosts have met. And your people? asked Kars. Do they share your feelings in this? They do, Lord. But enough are tempted by power and spoils. She broke off, looking Kars straight in the face. I have already said enough to bring your wrath upon me. Therefore I will finish, for I think now that Sark is truly doomed, even in victory. The serpent gives us aid not for our sakes, but as part of its own design. We have become no more than tools by which care do gains its ends. And now that you have come back to lead the Duvians... She stopped and there was no need for her to finish. The opening of the door saved Cars from the necessity of an answer. The Chamberlain said apologetically, Highness, your father sends answer that he does not understand your bold words, and again begs you to wait his pleasure. Owain thrust him angrily aside and strode to the tall doors, flinging them open. She stood back and said to Cars, Lord, will you enter? He drew a deep breath and entered, striding down the long, dim length of the throne room like a very god, with a wane following behind. The place seemed empty except for Garrich, who had sprung to his feet on the dais at the far end. He wore a robe of black velvet worked in gold, and he had a wane's graceful height and handsomeness of feature. But her honest strength was not in him nor her pride, nor her level gaze. For all his graying beard, he had a mouth of a petulant, greedy child. Beside him, withdrawn into the shadows by the high seat, another stood also. A dark figure, hooded and cloaked, its face concealed, its hands hidden in the wide sleeves of its robe. What means this? cried Garrich angrily. Daughter or not, Owain, I'll not stand for such insolence. Owain bent her knee. My father, she said clearly, I bring you the Lord Rhiannon of the Quiru, returned from the dead. Garrich's face paled by degrees to the color of ash. His mouth opened, but no words came. He stared at Kars and then at Owain and finally at the cowled, hooded Duvian. This is madness, he stammered at last. Nevertheless, said Owain, I bear witness to its truth. Rhiannon's mind lives in the body of this barbarian. He spoke to the wise ones at Condor, and he has spoken since to me. It is Rhiannon who stands before you. Again there was silence as Garrett stared and stared and trembled. Carr stood tall and lordly, outwardly contemptuous of doubt and waiting for acknowledgement. But the old chilling fear was in him. He knew that Ophidian eyes watched him from the shadow under the Duvian's cowl, 
and it seemed that he could feel their cold gaze sliding through his imposture as a knife blade slips through paper. The mind knowledge of the halflings. The strong extrasensory perception that could see beyond the appearances of the flesh. And the Duvians, for all their evil, were halflings too. Kars wanted nothing more at that moment than to break and run. But he forced himself to play the god, arrogant and self-assured, smiling at Garrett's fear. Deep within his brain, in the corner that was no longer his own, he felt a strange and utter stillness. It was as though the invader, the cursed one, had gone. Kars forced himself to speak making his voice ring back from the walls in stern echoes. The memories of children are indeed short, when even the favorite pupil has forgotten the master. And he bent his gaze upon his shah, the Duvian. Do you also doubt me, child of the snake? Must I teach you again, as I taught Sasan? He lifted the great sword, and Garrich's eyes flickered to a wane. She said, The Lord Rhiannon slew Sasan aboard the galley. Garrich dropped to his knees. Lord, he said submissively, what is your will? Kars ignored him, looking still at the Duvian, and the cowled figure moved forward with a peculiar gliding step and spoke in its soft, hateful voice. Lord, I also ask, what is your will? The dark robe rippled as the creature seemed to kneel. It is well. Kars crossed his hands over the hilt of the sword, dimming the luster of the jewel. The fleet of the Sea Kings stands in to attack soon. I would have my ancient weapons brought to me, that I may crush the enemies of Sark and Kerdu, who are also my enemies. A great hope sprang into Garrett's eyes. It was obvious that fear gnawed his vitals. Fear of many things, Kars thought. But just now, above all, fear of the Sea Kings. He glanced aside to his shah, and the cowled creature said, Lord, your weapons have been taken to Kaer Du. The Earthman's heart sank. Then he remembered Rold of Condor and how they must have broken him to get the secret of the tomb, and a blind rage came over him. The snarl of fury in his voice was not feigned, only the sense of his words. You dared to tamper with the power of Rhiannon? He advanced toward the Duvian. Can it be that the pupil now hopes to outrival the master? No, lord. The veiled head bowed but we have kept your weapons safe for you. Kars permitted his features to relax somewhat. Very well, then. See that they are returned to me here and at once. His shah rose. Yes, lord. I will go now to Kaer Du to do your bidding. The Duvian glided toward the inner door and was gone, leaving Kars in a secret sweat of mingled relief and apprehension. 17. Kaer Du The next few hours were an eternity of unbearable tension for Kars. He demanded an apartment for himself, on the ground that he must have privacy to draw his plans. And there he paced up and down in a fine state of nerves, looking most ungodlike. It seemed that he had succeeded. The Duvian had accepted him. Perhaps, he thought. The serpent folk, after all, lack the astoundingly developed extrasensory powers of the swimmers and the winged men. It appeared that all he had to do now was to wait for the Duvian to return with the weapons, load them aboard his ship, and go away. He could do that, for no one would dare to question the plans of Rhiannon, and he had time also. The Sea King's fleet was standing off, waiting for all its force to come up. There would be no attack before dawn. None at all, if he succeeded. 
but some raw primitive nerve twitched to the sense of danger, and Kars was oppressed by a foreboding fear. He sent for Bagaz on the pretext of giving orders concerning the galley. His real reason was that he could not bear to be alone. The fat thief was jubilant when he heard the news. You have brought it off, he chuckled, rubbing his hands together in delight. I have always said, Kars, that sheer gall would carry a man through anything. I, Bagaz, could not have done better. Kars said dourly, I hope you're right. Bagaz gave him a sidelong glance. Kars? Yes? What of the cursed one himself? Nothing. Not a sign. It worries me, Bagaz. I have the feeling that he's waiting. When you get the weapons in your hands, Bagaz said meaningly, I'll stand by you with a belaying pin. The soft-footed Chamberlain brought word at last that his shah had returned from Caer Du and awaited audience with him. It is well, said Kars, and then nodded curtly toward Bagaz. This man will come with me to supervise the handling of the weapons. The Valkyrian's ruddy cheeks lost several shades of color, but he came perforce at Kars's heels. Garrich and Ewain were in the throne room, and the black-cowled creature from Caer Du. All bowed as Kars entered. Well, he demanded of the Duvian, have you obeyed my command? Lord, said his shah softly, I took counsel with the elders who sent you this word. Had they known that the Lord Rhiannon had returned, they would not have presumed to touch those things which are his. And now they fear to touch them again, lest their ignorance they do damage or cause destruction. Therefore, Lord, they beg you to arrange this matter yourself. Also, they have not forgotten their love for Rhiannon, whose teachings raised them from the dust. They wish to welcome you to your old kingdom in Caer Du, for your children have been long in darkness and would once again know the light of Rhiannon's wisdom and his strength. Isha made a low obeisance. Lord, will you grant them this? Carr stood silent for a moment, trying desperately to conceal his dread. He could not go to Caer Du. He dared not go. How long could he hope to conceal his deception from the children of the serpent, the oldest deceiver of all? If indeed he had concealed it at all. Isha's soft words reeked of a subtle trap. And trapped he was, and knew it. He dared not go. But even more, he dared not refuse. He said, I am pleased to grant them their request. Isha bowed his head in thanks. All preparations are made. The King Garrich and his daughter will accompany you, that you may be suitably attended. Your children realize the need for haste. The barge is waiting. Good. Kars turned on his heel fixing Bagaz as he did so with a steely look. You will attend me also, man of Valkis. I may have need of you with regard to the weapons. Bagaz got his meaning. If he had paled before, he turned now a livid white with pure horror. But there was not a word he could say. Like a man led to execution, he followed Kars out of the throne room. Night brooded black and heavy as they embarked at the palace stair in a low black craft without sail or oar. Creatures hooded and robed like a shah thrust long poles into the water, and the barge moved out into the estuary, heading up away from the sea. Garrich crouched amid the sable cushions of a divan, an unkingly figure with shaking hands and cheeks the color of bone. His eyes kept furtively seeking the muffled form of his shah. It was plain that he did not relish this visit to the court of his allies. But Wayne had withdrawn herself to the far side of the barge, where she sat looking out into the somber darkness of the marshy shore. 
Cars thought she seemed more depressed than she ever had when she was a prisoner in chains. He too sat by himself, outwardly lordly and magnificent, inwardly shaken to the soul. Bagaz crouched nearby. His eyes were the eyes of a sick man. And the cursed one, the real Rhiannon, was still. Too still. In that buried corner of Kars's mind, there was not a stir, not a flicker. It seemed that the dark outcast of the Quiru was like all the others aboard, withdrawn and waiting. It seemed a long way up the estuary. The water slid past the barge with a whisper of sibilant mirth. The black-robed figures bent and swayed at the poles. Now and again a bird cried from the marshland, and the night air was heavy and brooding. Then, in the light of the little low moons, Carr saw ahead the ragged walls and ramparts of a city rising from the mists. An old, old city, walled like a castle. It sprawled away into ruin on all sides, and only the great central keep was whole. There was a flickering radiance in the air around the place. Kars thought that it was his imagination, a visual illusion caused by the moonlight and the glowing water and the pale mist. The barge drew in toward a crumbling quay. It came to rest, and his shah stepped ashore, bowing as he waited for Rhiannon to pass. Car strode up along the quay with Garish and Wayne, and the shivering Bagaz followed. His shah remained deferentially at the earthman's heels. A causeway of black stone, much cracked by the weight of years, led up toward the citadel. Car set his feet resolutely upon it. Now he was sure that he could see a faint, pulsing web of light around Caer Du. It lay over the whole city, glimmering with a steely luminescence, like starlight on a frosty night. He did not like the look of it. As he approached it, where it crossed the causeway like a veil before the great gate, he liked it less and less. Yet no one spoke. No one faltered. He seemed to be expected to lead the way, and he did not dare to betray his ignorance of the nature of the thing. So he forced his steps to go on, strong and sure. He was close enough to the gleaming web to feel a strange prickling of force. One more stride would have taken him into it. And then his shah said sharply in his ear, Lord, have you forgotten the veil whose touch is death? Kars recoiled. A shock of fear went through him, and at the same time he realized that he had blundered badly. He said quickly, Of course I have not forgotten. No, Lord, Ishah murmured. How indeed could you forget when it was you who taught us the secret of the veil which warps space and shields Caer Du from any force? Kars knew now that the gleaming web was a defensive barrier of energy of such potent energy that it somehow set up a space strain which nothing could penetrate. It seemed incredible, yet Quiru's science had been great, and Rhiannon had taught some of it to the forefathers of these Duvians. How indeed could you forget? his shah repeated. There was no hint of mockery in his words, and yet Kars felt that it was there. The Duvians stepped forward, raising his sleeved arms in a signal to some watcher within the gate. The luminescence of the veil died out above the causeway, leaving a path open through it. And as Kars turned to go on, he saw that a wain was staring at him with a look of startled wonder, in which a doubt was already beginning to grow. The great gate swung open, and the Lord Rhiannon of the Quiru was received into Caer Du. The ancient halls were dimly lighted by what seemed to be globes of prisoned fire that stood on tripods at long intervals, shedding a cool greenish glow. The air was warm, and the taint of the serpent lay heavy in it, closing Kars's throat with its hateful sickliness. His shah went before them now, 
and that in itself was a sign of danger, since Rhiannon should have known the way. But Ashaw said that he wished the honor of announcing his lord, and Kars could do nothing but choke down his growing terror and follow. They came into a vast central place, closed in by towering walls of the black rock that rose to a high vault, lost in darkness overhead. Below, a single large globe lighted the heavy shadows. Little light for human eyes, but even that was too much. For here the children of the serpent were gathered to greet their lord, and here in their own place they were not shrouded in the cowled robes they wore when they went among men. The swimmers belonged to the sea, the sky folk to the high air, and they were perfect and beautiful in accordance with their elements. Now Kars saw the third pseudo-human race of the halflings, the children of the hidden places, the perfect, dreadfully perfect offspring of another great order of life. In the first overwhelming shock of revulsion, Kars was hardly aware of Hisha's voice saying the name of Rhiannon, and the soft, sibilant cry of greeting that followed was only the tongue of nightmare speaking. From the edges of the wide floor, they hailed him, and from the open galleries above, their depthless eyes glittering, their narrow ophidian heads bowed in homage. Sinuous bodies that moved with effortless ease, seeming to flow rather than step. Hands with supple, jointless fingers and feet that made no sound, and lipless mouths that seemed to open always on silent laughter infinitely cruel. And all through that vast place whispered a dry, harsh rustling, the light friction of skin that had lost its primary scales but not its serpentine roughness. Kars raised the sword of Rhiannon in acknowledgment of that welcome and forced himself to speak. Rhiannon is pleased by the greeting of his children. It seemed to him that a little hissing ripple of mirth ran through the great hall. But he could not be sure, and Asha said, My lord, here are your ancient weapons. They were in the center of the cleared space. All the cryptic mechanisms he had seen in the tomb were here. The great flat crystal wheel, the squat looped metal rods, the others, all glittering in the dim light. Kars's heart leaped and settled to a heavy pounding. Good, he said. The time is short. Take them aboard the barge, that I may return to Sark at once. Certainly, Lord, said Hisha. But will you not inspect them first, to make sure that all is well? Our ignorance handling... Kars strode to the weapons and made a show of examining them. Then he nodded. No damage has been done. And now... Isha broke in, unctuously courteous. Before you go, will you not explain the workings of these instruments? Your children were always hungry for knowledge. There is no time for that, Kars said angrily. Also, you are as you say. Children, you could not comprehend. Can it be, Lord? asked Hisha very softly, that you, yourself, do not comprehend? There was a moment of utter stillness. The icy certainty of doom took Kars in its grip. He saw now that the ranks of the Duvians had closed in behind him, barring all hope of escape. Within the circle, Garish and Ewain and Bagaz stood with him, there was shocked amazement on Garage's face, and the Valkyrian sagged with a weight of horror that had come as no surprise to him. Owain alone was not amazed or horrified. She looked at Kars with the eyes of a woman who fears, but in a different way. It came to Kars that she feared for him, that she did not want him to die. In a last desperate attempt to save himself, Kars cried out furiously, What means this insolence? Would you have me take up my weapons and use them against you? 
Do so, if you can, Isha said softly. Do so, O false Rhiannon, for assuredly by no other means will you ever leave Care Do. 18. The Wrath of Rhiannon Carr stood where he was, surrounded by the crystal and metal mechanisms that had no meaning for him, and knew with terrible finality that he was beaten. And now the hissing laughter broke forth on all sides, infinitely cruel and jeering. Garrich put out a trembling hand toward his shah. Then, he stammered, this is not Rhiannon? Even your human mind should tell you that much now, answered his shah contemptuously. He had thrown back his cowl, and now he moved toward Kars, his ophidian eyes full of mockery. By the touching of minds alone, I would have known you false. But even that I did not need. You, Rhiannon, Rhiannon of the Quiru, who came in peace and brotherhood to greet his children in Cairdu. The stealthy evil laughter hissed from every Duvian throat, and his shah threw his head back, the skin of his throat pulsing with his mirth. Look at him, my brothers. Hail, Rhiannon, who did not know of the veil, nor why it gods care do. And they hailed him, bowing low. Carr stood very still. For the moment, he had even forgotten to be afraid. You fool, said his shah. Rhiannon hated us at the end, for at the end he learned his folly, learned that the pupils to whom he gave the crumbs of knowledge had grown too clever. With the veil, whose secret he had taught us, we made our city impregnable even to his mighty weapons, so that when he turned finally against us, it was too late. Carr said slowly, why did he turn against you? His shah laughed. He learned the use we had for the knowledge he had given us. A wain came forward one step and said, What was that use? I think you know already, his shah answered. That is why you and Garrich were summoned here, not only to see this impostor unmasked, but to learn once and for all your place in our world. His soft voice had in it now the bite of the conqueror. Since Rhiannon was locked in his tomb, we have gained subtle dominance on every shore of the White Sea. We are few in number and averse to open warfare. Therefore we have worked through the human kingdoms, using your greedy people as our tools. Now we have the weapons of Rhiannon. Soon we will master their use, and then we will no longer need human tools. The children of the serpent will rule in every palace, and we will require only obedience and respect from our subjects. How think you of that, O Wayne of the proud head, who have always loathed and scorned us? I think, said Owain, that I will fall upon my own sword first. His shah shrugged. Fall, then. He turned to Garrich. And you? But Garrich had already crumbled to the stones in a dead faint. His shah turned again to Kars. And now, he said, you shall see how we welcome our lord. Bagaz moaned and covered his face with his hands. Kars gripped the feudal sword tighter and asked in a strange low voice, And no one ever knew that Rhiannon had finally turned against you Duvians? His shah answered softly, The Quiru knew. But nevertheless, they condemned Rhiannon because his repentance came too late. Other than they, only we knew. And why should we tell the world when it pleased our humor to see Rhiannon, who hated us, cursed as our friend? 
Karst closed his eyes. The world rocked under him, and there was a roaring in his ears as the revelation burst upon him. Rhiannon had spoken the truth in the place of the wise ones. He had spoken truth when he voiced his hatred of the Duvians. The hall was filled with a sound like the rustling of dry leaves as the ranks of the Duvians closed gently in toward Kars. With an effort of will almost beyond human strength, Kars threw open all the channels of his mind, trying desperately now, in this last minute, to reach inward to that strangely silent, hidden corner. He cried aloud, Rhiannon! That hoarse cry made the Duvians pause, not because of fear, but because of laughter. This, indeed, was the climax of the jest. His shah cried, I call upon Rhiannon. Perhaps he will come from his tomb to aid you. And they watched Kars out of their depthless, jeering eyes as he swayed in torment. But Owain knew. Swiftly she moved to Kars's side, and her sword came rasping out of the sheath to protect him as long as it could. His shah laughed. A fitting pair, the princess without an empire and the would-be god. Kars said again in a broken whisper, Rhiannon! And Rhiannon answered. From the depths of Kars's mind, where he had lain hidden, the cursed one came, surging in terrible strength through every cell and atom of the Earthman's brain, possessing him utterly now that Kars had opened the way. As it had been before in the place of the wise ones, the consciousness of Matthew Kars stood aside in his own body and watched and listened. He heard the voice of Rhiannon, the real and godlike voice that he had only copied, ring forth from his own lips in anger that was beyond human power to know. Behold your Lord, O crawling children of the serpent! Behold and die! The mocking laughter died away into silence. His shah gave back, and into his eyes came the beginning of fear. Rhiannon's voice rolled out, thundering against the walls. The strength and fury of Rhiannon blazed in the Earthman's face, and now his body seemed to tower over the Duvians, and the sword was a thing of lightning in his hands. What now of the touching of mine, Sisha? Probe deeply, more deeply than you did before when your feeble powers could not penetrate the mental barrier I set up against you. Hisha voiced a high and hissing scream. He recoiled in horror, and the circle of the Duvians broke as they turned to seek their weapons, their lipless mouths stretched wide in fear. Rhiannon laughed, the terrible laughter of one who has waited through an age for vengeance and finds it at last. Run, run and strive, for in your great wisdom you have let Rhiannon through your guarding veil, and death is on care due. And the Duvians ran, writhing in the shadows as they caught up the weapons they had not thought to need. The green light glinted on the shining tubes and prisms. But the hand of Kars, guided now by the sure knowledge of Rhiannon, had darted toward the biggest of the ancient weapons, toward the rim of the great flat crystal wheel. He set the wheel spinning. There must have been some intricate triggering of power within the metal globe, some hidden control that his fingers touched. Kars never knew. He only knew that a strange dark halo appeared in the dim air, enclosing himself and Owain, and the shuddering Bagaz and Garich, who had risen dog-like to his hands and knees and was watching with eyes that held no shred of sanity. The ancient weapons were also enclosed in that ring of dark force, 
and a faint singing rose from the crystal rods. The dark ring began to expand, like a circular wave sweeping outward. The weapons of the Duvians strove against it, lances of lightning, of cold flame and searing brilliance, leaped toward it, struck, and splintered and died. Powerful electric discharges that broke themselves on the invisible dielectric that shielded Rhiannon's circle. Rhiannon's ring of dark force expanded relentlessly, out and out, and where it touched the Duvians, the cold of Phidian bodies withered and shriveled and lay like cast-off skins upon the stones. Rhiannon spoke no more. Kars felt the deadly throb of power in his hand, as the shining wheel spun faster and faster on its mount, and his mind shuddered away from what he could sense in Rhiannon's mind. For he could sense dimly the nature of the Cursed One's terrible weapon. It was akin to that deadly ultraviolet radiation of the sun, which would destroy all life were it not for the shielding ozone in the atmosphere. But where the ultraviolet radiation known to Kars's Earth science was easily absorbed, that of Rhiannon's ancient alien science lay in uncharged octaves below the 400 angstrom limit and could be produced as an expanding halo that no matter could absorb. And where it touched living tissue, it killed. Kars hated the Duvians, but never in the world had there been such hatred in a human heart as he now felt in Rhiannon. Garrich began to whimper. Whimpering, he recoiled from the blazing eyes of the man who towered above him. Half scrambling, half running, he darted away with a sound like laughter in his throat. Straight out into the dark ring he ran, and death received him and silently withered him. Spreading, spreading, the silent force pulsed outward. Through metal and flesh and stone it went, withering, killing, hunting down the last child of the serpent who fled through the dark corridors of Cairdu. No more weapons flamed against it. No more supple arms were raised to fend it off. It struck the enclosing veil at last. Kars felt the subtle shock of its checking, and then Rhiannon stopped the wheel. There was a time of utter silence as those three who were left alive in the city stood motionless, too stunned almost to breathe. At last, the voice of Rhiannon spoke. The serpent is dead. Let his city and my weapons that have wrought such evil in this world Pass with the Duvians. He turned from the crystal wheel and sought another instrument, one of the squat, looped metal rods. He raised the small black thing and pressed a secret spring, and from the leaden tube that formed its muzzle came a little spark, too bright for the eye to look upon. Only a tiny fleck of light that settled on the stones. But it began to glow. It seemed to feed on the atoms of the rock, as flame feeds on wood. Like wildfire, it leaped across the flags. It touched the crystal wheel, and the weapon that had destroyed the serpent was itself consumed. A chain reaction such as no nuclear scientist of Earth had conceived, one that could make the atoms of metal and crystal and stone as unstable as the high-number radioactive elements. Rhiannon said, Come. They walked through the empty corridors in silence, and behind them the strange witch fire fed and fattened, and the vast central hall was enveloped in its swift destruction. The knowledge of Rhiannon guided Kars to the nerve center of the Vale, to a chamber by the Great Gate, there to set the controls so that the glimmering web was forever darkened. They passed out of the citadel and went back down the broken causeway to the quay where the black barge floated. Then they turned and looked back upon the destruction of the city. They shielded their eyes, for the strange and awful blaze 
had something in it of the fire of the sun. It had raced hungrily outward through the sprawling ruins, and made of the central keep a torch that lighted all the sky, blotting out the stars, paling the low moons. The causeway began to burn, a lengthening tongue of flame between the reeds of the marshland. Rhiannon raised the squat, looped tube again. From it, now, a dim little globule of light, not a spark, flew toward the nearing blaze. And the blaze hesitated, wavered, then began to dull and die. The witch fire of strange atomic reaction that Rhiannon had triggered, he had now dampened and killed by some limiting counterfactor, whose nature Kars could not dream. They pulled the barge out onto the water, as the quivering radiance behind them sank and died. And then the night was dark again, and of care do, there was nothing to be seen but steam. The voice of Rhiannon spoke once more. It is done, he said. I have redeemed my sin. The earthman felt the utter weariness of the being within him as the possession was withdrawn from his brain and body. And then, again, he was only Matthew Carse. 19. Judgment of the Quiru The whole world seemed hushed and still in the dawn as their barge went down to Sark. None of them spoke, and none of them looked back at the vast white stream that still rolled solemnly up across the sky. Kars felt numbed, drained of all emotion. He had let the wrath of Rhiannon use him, and he could not yet feel quite the same. He knew that there was something of it still in his face, for the other two would not quite meet his eyes, nor did they break the silence. The great crowd gathered on the waterfront of Sark was silent too. It seemed that they had stood there for long, looking toward Cairdu. And even now, after the glare of its destruction had died out of the sky, they stared with white, frightened faces. Kars looked out at the conned longships riding with their sails slack against the yards, and knew that the terrible blaze had awed the Sea Kings into waiting. The black barge glided into the palace stair. The crowd surged forward as a wane stepped ashore, their voices rising in a strange, hushed clamor. And a wane spoke to them. Care do and the serpent both are gone, destroyed by Lord Rhiannon. She turned instinctively toward Kars, and the eyes of all that vast throng dwelt upon him as the word spread, growing at last to an overwhelming cry of thankfulness. Rhiannon! Rhiannon the Deliverer! He was the cursed one no longer, at least not to these sarks. And for the first time, Kars realized the loathing they had had for the allies Garrich had forced upon them. He walked toward the palace with Wayne and Bagaz, and knew with a sense of awe how it felt to be a god. They entered the dim, cool walls, and it seemed already as though a shadow had gone out of them. Wayne paused at the doors of the throne room, as though she had just remembered that she was the ruler now in Garrich's place. She turned to Kars and said, If the Sea Kings still attack, they won't. Not until they know what happened. And now we must find Rold, if he still lives. He lives, said Owain. After the Duvians emptied Rold of his knowledge, my father held him as hostage for me. They found the Lord of Condor at last, chained in the dungeons deep under the palace walls. He was wasted and drawn with suffering, but he still had the spirit left to raise his red head and snarl at Kars and Owain. Demon, he said. Traitor, have you and your hellcat come at last to kill me? Kars told him the story of Cairdu and Rhiannon, 
watching Rold's expression change slowly from savage despair to a stunned and unbelieving joy. Your fleet stands off Sark under Ironbeard, he finished. Will you take this word to the Sea Kings and bring them in to parley? Aye, said Rold. By the gods, I will. He stared at Kars, shaking his head. A strange dream of madness these last days have been. And now, to think that I would have slain you gladly in the place of the wise ones with my own hand. That was shortly after dawn. By noon, the council of the Sea Kings had assembled in the throne room with Rold at their head, and a mayor who had refused to stay behind in Condor. They sat around a long table. Owain occupied the throne, and Kar stood apart from all of them. His face was stern and very weary, and there was in it still a hint of strangeness. He said with finality, There need be no war now. The serpent is gone, and without its power, Sark can no longer oppress her neighbors. The subject cities, like Jakara and Valkus, will be freed. The empire of Sark is no more. Ironbeard leaped to his feet, crying fiercely, Then now is our chance to destroy Sark forever! Others of the Sea Kings rose, Thorn of Tarek loud among them, shouting their assent. Wayne's hand tightened upon her sword. Kars stepped forward, his eyes blazing. I say there will be peace. Must I call upon Rhiannon to enforce my word? They quieted, awed by that threat, and Rold bade them sit and hold their tongues. There has been enough of fighting and bloodshed, he told them sternly. And for the future, we can meet Sark on equal terms. I am Lord of Condor, and I say that Condor will make peace. Caught between Kars's threat and Rold's decision, the Sea Kings one by one agreed. Then Amer spoke. The slaves must all be freed, human and halfling alike. Kars nodded. It will be done. And, said Rold, there is another condition. He faced Kars with unalterable determination. I have said we will make peace with Sark, but not, though you bring fifty Rhiannons against us, with a Sark that is ruled by Owain. Aye, roared the Sea Kings, looking wolf-eyed at Owain. That is our word also. There was a silence then, and Owain rose from the high seat, her face proud and somber. The condition is met, she said. I have no wish to rule over a Sark, tamed and stripped of empire. I hated the serpent as you did, but it is too late for me to be the queen of a petty village of fishermen. The people may choose another ruler. She stepped down from the dais and went from them to stand erect by a window at the far end of the room, looking out over the harbor. Kars turned to the Sea Kings. It is agreed, then. And they answered, It is agreed. A mare, whose fey gaze had not wavered from Kars since the beginning of the parley, came to his side now, laying her hand on his. And where is your place in this? she asked softly. Kars looked down at her, rather dazedly. I have not had time to think. But it must be thought of, now. And he did not know. As long as he bore within him the shadow of Rhiannon, this world would never accept him as a man. Honor he might have, but never anything more, and the lurking fear of the cursed one would remain. Too many centuries of hate had grown around that name. Rhiannon had redeemed his crime, but even so, as long as Mars lived, he would be remembered as the cursed one.
as though in answer, for the first time since care due. The dark invader stirred, and his thought voice whispered in Kars's mind. Go back to the tomb, and I will leave you, for I would follow my brothers. After that, you are free. I can guide you back along that pathway to your own time if you wish, or you can remain here. And still, Kars did not know. He liked this green and smiling Mars. But as he looked at the Sea Kings, who were waiting for his answer, and then beyond them through the windows to the white sea and the marshes, it came to him that this was not his world, that he could never truly belong to it. He spoke at last, and as he did so, he saw Owain's face turned toward him in the shadows. A mare knew and the halflings also, that I was not of your world. I came out of space and time, along the pathway which is hidden in the tomb of Rhiannon. He paused to let them grasp that, and they did not seem greatly astonished. Because of what had happened, they could believe anything of him, even though it be beyond their comprehension. Kars said heavily, a man is born into one world, and there he belongs. I am going back to my own place. He could see that even though they protested courteously, the Sea Kings were relieved. The blessings of the gods attend you, stranger, a mare whispered, and kissed him gently on the lips. Then she went, and the jubilant Sea Kings went with her. Bagaz had slipped out, and Kars and Owain were alone in the great empty room. He went to her, looking into her eyes that had not lost their old fire, even now. And where will you go now? he asked her. She answered quietly, If you will let me, I will go with you. He shook his head. No, you could not live in my world, Owain. It's a cruel and bitter place, very old and near to death. It does not matter. My own world also is dead. He put his hands on her shoulders, strong beneath the mailed shirt. You don't understand. I came a long way across time, a million years. He paused, not quite knowing how to tell her. Look out there. Think how it will be when the White Sea is only a desert of blowing dust, when the green is gone from the hills, and the white cities are crumbled, and the riverbeds are dry. Owain understood and sighed. Age and death come at last to everything, and death will come very swiftly to me if I remain here. I am outcast, and my name is hated even as Rhiannon's. He knew that she was not afraid of death, but was merely using that argument to sway him. And yet the argument was true. Could you be happy? he asked, with the memory of your own world haunting you at every step. I have never been happy, she answered, and therefore I shall not miss it. She looked at him fairly, I will take the risk. Will you? His fingers tightened. Yes, he said huskily. Yes, I will. He took her in his arms and kissed her. And when she drew back, she whispered, with a shyness utterly new in her. The Lord Rhiannon spoke truly when he taunted me concerning the barbarian. She was silent a moment then added, I think which world we dwell in will not matter much, as long as we are together in it. Days later, the black galley pulled into Jakara Harbor, finishing her last voyage under the ensign of a wane of Sark. It was a strange greeting she and Kars received there, where the whole city had gathered to see the stranger, who was also the cursed one, and the sovereign lady of Sark, who was no more a sovereign. The crowd kept back at a respectful distance, 
and they cheered the destruction of Caer Du and the death of the serpent. But for Owain, they had no welcome. Only one man stood on the quay to meet them. It was Bagaz, a very splendid Bagaz, robed in velvet and loaded down with jewels, wearing a golden circlet on his head. He had vanished out of Sark on the day of the parley, on some mission of his own, and it seemed that he had succeeded. He bowed to Kars and Owain with grandiloquent politeness. I have been to Valkis, he said. It is a free city again, and because of my unparalleled heroism in helping to destroy Caer Du, I have been chosen king. He beamed, and then added with a confidential grin, I always did dream of looting a royal treasury. But, Kars reminded him, it's your treasury now. Bagaz started, By the gods, it is so. He drew himself up, waxing suddenly stern. I see that I shall have to be severe with thieves in Vulcus. There will be heavy punishment for any crime against property, especially royal property. And fortunately, said Kars gravely, you are acquainted with all the knavish tricks of thieves. That is true, said Bagaz sententiously. I have always said that knowledge is a valuable thing. Behold now how my purely academic studies of the lawless elements will help me to keep my people safe. He accompanied them through Jakara until they reached the open country beyond, and then he bade them farewell, plucking off a ring which he thrust into Kars's hand. Tears ran down his fat cheeks. Wear this, old friend, that you may remember Bogaz, who guided your steps wisely through a strange world. He turned and stumbled away, and Kars watched his fat figure vanish into the streets of the city, where they had first met. All alone, Kars and Owain made their way into the hills above Jakara, and came at last to the tomb. They stood together on the rocky ledge, looking out across the wooded hills and the glowing sea, and the distant towers of the city, white in the sunlight. Are you still sure, Kars asked her, that you wish to leave all this? I have no place here now, she answered sadly. I would be rid of this world as it would be rid of me. She turned and strode without hesitation into the dark tunnel. Owain the proud, that not even the gods themselves could break. Kars went with her, holding a lighted torch. Through the echoing vault and beyond the door marked with the curse of Rhiannon, into the inner chamber, where the torchlight struck against the darkness, the utter darkness of that strange aperture in the space-time continuum of the universe. At that last moment, Owain's face showed fear, and she caught the Earthman's hand. The tiny motes swarmed and flickered before them in the gloom of time itself. The voice of Rhiannon spoke to Kars, and he stepped forward into the darkness, holding tightly to Owain's hand. This time, at first, there was no headlong plunge into nothingness. The wisdom of Rhiannon guided and steadied them. The torch went out. Kars dropped it. His heart pounded, and he was blind and deaf in the soundless vortex of force. Again, Rhiannon spoke. See now with my mind what your human eyes could not see before. The pulsing darkness cleared in some strange way that had nothing to do with light or sight. Kars looked upon Rhiannon. His body lay in a coffin of dark crystal, whose inner facets glowed with a subtle force that prisoned him forever, as though frozen in the heart of a jewel. Through the cloudy substance, Kars could make out dimly a naked form of more than human strength and beauty, so vital and instinct with life 
that it seemed a terrible thing to prison in it that narrow space. The face also was beautiful, dark and imperious and stormy, even now with the eyes closed as though in death. But there could be no death in this place. It was beyond time, and without time there is no decay, and Rhiannon would have all eternity to lie there, remembering his sin. While he stared, Kars realized that the alien being had withdrawn from him so gently and carefully that there had been no shock. His mind was still in touch with the mind of Rhiannon, but the strange dualism was ended. The Cursed One had released him. Yet, through that sympathy that still existed between these two minds that had been one for so long, Kars heard Rhiannon's passionate call a mental cry that pulsed far out along the pathway through space and time. My brothers of the Quiru, hear me! I have undone my ancient crime! Again he called with all the wild strength of his will. There was a period of silence, of nothingness, and then, gradually, Carr sensed the approach of other minds, grave and powerful and stern. He would never know from what far world they had come. Long ago the Quiru had gone out by this road that led beyond the universe to cosmic regions forever outside his ken. And now they had come back briefly in answer to Rhiannon's call. Dim and shadowy, Carr saw godlike forms come slowly into being tenuous as shining smoke in the gloom. Let me go with you, my brothers, for I have destroyed the serpent, and my sin is redeemed. It seemed that the Quiru pondered, searching Rhiannon's heart for truth. Then at last, one stepped forward and laid his hand upon the coffin. The subtle fires died within it. It is our judgment that Rhiannon may go free. A giddiness came over Kars. The scene began to fade. He saw Rhiannon rise and go to join his brothers of the Quiru, his body growing shadowy as he passed. He turned once to look at Kars, and his eyes were open now, full of joy beyond human understanding. Keep my sword, Earthman. Bear it proudly, for without you, I could never have destroyed Kaer Du. Dizzy, half fainting, Kars received the last mental command, and as he staggered with a wane through the dark vortex, falling now with nightmare swiftness through the eerie gloom, he heard the last ringing echo of Rhiannon's farewell. 20. The Return There was solid rock under their feet at last. They crept trembling away from the vortex, white-faced and shaken, saying nothing, wanting only to be free of that dark vault. Kars found the tunnel, but when he reached the end, he was oppressed by a dread that he might be once again lost in time and dared not look out. He need not have feared. Rhiannon had guided them surely. He stood again among the barren hills of his own Mars. It was sunset, and the vast reaches of the dead sea bottom were flooded with a full red light. The wind came cold and dry out of the desert, blowing the dust, and there was Jakara in the distance, his own Jakara of the low canals. He turned anxiously to a wane watching her face as she looked for the first time upon his world. He saw her lips tighten as though over a deep pain. Then she threw her shoulders back and smiled and settled the hilt of her sword in its sheath. Let us go, she said, and placed her hand again in his. They walked the long, weary way across the desolate land, and the ghosts of the past were all around them. 
Now, over the bones of Mars, Karst could see the living flesh that had clothed it once in splendor, the tall trees and the rich earth, and he would never forget. He looked out across the dead sea bottom and knew that all the years of his life he would hear the booming roll of surf on the shores of a spectral ocean. Darkness came. The little low moons rose in the cloudless sky. Owain's hand was firm and strong in his. Kars was aware of a great happiness rising within him. His steps quickened. They came into the streets of Jakara, the crumbling streets beside the low canal. The dry wind shook the torches, and the sound of the harps was as he remembered. And the little dark women made tinkling music as they walked. Owain smiled. It is still Mars, she said. They walked together through the twisting ways. The man who still bore in his face the dark shadow of a god, and the woman who had been a queen. The people drew apart to let them pass, staring after them in wonder, and the sword of Rhiannon was like a scepter in Kars's hand. This has been an Audible Frontiers production of The Sword of Rhiannon, written by Lee Brackett, narrated by Mike Chamberlain. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright, 1953, by Ace Books. Production copyright, 2012, by Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.